Okay, the Ten Commandments. So we'll open up with just a little prayer. Holy Father, we do bless, bless you for this time and this Holy Sabbath day and this time to open your word, study your word. And Father, as we go through this message, may it be your words that ring true and clear. Take my emotion out of it, take my thoughts out of it, put your thought and your word that everything that is said be heard in the way you intend for it to be heard. Father, we do lift this before you in Jesus Christ, our holy Messiah's name. Amen. This is an interesting slide. I didn't pick it. I'm guessing Ken did. And uh, thank you for that, Ken. And this will actually work pretty good later on in, the, in this sermon. Uh, by the way, we're only going to focus on the Exodus. I had put both Exodus and Deuteronomy uh, in here, but uh, boy, if I, if I, uh, I initially thought I would do some comparisons, but uh, as I got to an hour for each of the two sermons, I decided that we needed to start chopping some things out, and uh, um, so hopefully I've got it chopped back to a reasonable length. Uh, so if there are some transition issues, uh, it's because I cut some stuff out of the sermon to get it back to a reasonable length uh, so that we weren't here till 3 o'clock today uh, talking about this. Anyway, I am uh, stepping away from my usual habit. As, as most are aware, I usually teach from the Torah portion for the week. Um, but I've been wanting to do a, a, a mini-series, a two-sermon series, where you, you have basically the same uh, uh, subject, but it takes longer to fully develop that. This really could have been a three- or a four-sermon series, uh, so it's kind of compressed <laughs> into a two-sermon series. Um, and this is the first opportunity I've had to uh, stretch a sermon over two weeks. Uh, and I also wanted something that appeared to me to be kind of relevant to our current situation. And as we get into this, you'll see some relevance uh, to what's going on today. So why the Ten Commandments? They are, after all, pretty much self-explanatory, aren't they? Everyone knows what they are, don't they? Yet there must be some level of ambiguity, because not everyone agrees on what each one means. Indeed, many Christians can't tell you what they are. Oh, they may get a couple of them right, but all ten. They are also pretty succinct, too. God said, so we do, right? But many even devout Christians don't do all of them. We also know exactly which commandment is which, right? Well, except the Jews number them one way, the Catholics and Lutherans another, and most Protestants a third way. What did the tablets that held the Ten Commandments look like? There's a depiction. Owing to the fact that these tablets were muscled up and down a mountain by an old, albeit physically fit man, speaks to the fact that they could not have been too large, right? And what were they made of? Granite is one of the more common workable stones in the mountains of Sinai, so that is a likely candidate. But according to the Talmud, the tablets were approximately 18 inches square. Square, not rectangular, square. By nine inches thick. That's pretty stout. And the Talmud says they were made out of sapphire, not granite. That's a lot of sapphire. In fact, the tablet would weigh about 250 pounds each. Now, a 683-pound single stone sapphire was found last year in Sri Lanka. So certainly a sapphire of appropriate size is feasible in nature. Although with God taking care of the logistics, nothing's off the table. No doubt Moses, Moses was a stout man. However, carrying 500 pounds of stone 
over a considerable distance? Now that's a conundrum. But perhaps there's more of a divine answer to this conundrum to be found in Exodus 32, 16. The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing. So just because sapphire or granite would normally be pretty heavy if the material was created by God for this specific purpose, would it necessarily be that heavy? Or would it potentially weigh less while Moses was carrying it up and down the mountain? Also, why sapphire? Or more to the point, why do the Jewish sages believe that sapphire was the material used? They pull this, at least in part, from Numbers 15, 37 to 39. Later, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and tell them that throughout the, gen the generations to come, they are to make for themselves tassels for the corners of their garments with a blue cord on each tassel. These will serve as tassels for you to look at so that you may remember all the commandments of the Lord. Mishnah Rabbi Eliezer, chapter 14, gives us this reasoning for why the blue, the techelet, uh, string in the, in the tzitzit or the tassels was used. Why does the Torah enjoin us regarding techelet? Because techelet resembles sapphire, and the tablets were made of sapphire. To tell you that as long as B'nai Yisrael, the sons of Israel, gaze upon this techelet, they are reminded of what is inscribed on the tablets and observe the commandments. Therefore it is written, and you shall see it, the techelet string, and remember all of the commandments of God, and you shall do them. Another interesting thing to contemplate comes from Exodus 32, 15. Thereupon Moses turned and went down from the mountain bearing the two tablets of the pact. The tablets were inscribed on both their surfaces. They were inscribed on one side and the other. This is interesting, isn't it? When, yet whenever we see the Ten Commandments displayed on a tablet or a rendering of the Ten Commandments on paper or a wall or stained glass, they are all listed on one side of the tablet. Also, the Ten Commandments are significantly abbreviated, often down to simply numbers. And this method of representing the Ten Commandments is traditional across all faiths that recognize the Ten Commandments. Now, we're not going to explore any of these little oddities surrounding the Ten Commandments. I merely list these to demonstrate that we may not know all that we think we know about the Ten Commandments. So we'll start with reading the Ten Commandments from Exodus 21 through 17, if you'll please stand. And God spoke these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or servant, uh, uh, female servant nor your animals or any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in it, or in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. 
Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or ser female servant, or uh, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Thank you. You may be seated. One very important detail of the Ten Commandments that is often missed by English speakers is that unlike English, where you and your can be singular or plural, Hebrew, you and your, have separate singular and plural forms. Each of the one of the Ten Commandments is written in the singular form. The word your God, Elohecha, is singular. One would easily think that this would be plural because God was addressing the entire Israelite nation. But no, the singular form is used throughout the Ten Commandments. And this is to emphasize that the Ten Commandments are directed to each and every person, to you and to me as an individual. Each commandment is in the singular. The Ten Commandments were engraved on two tablets. It is generally accepted that five commandments were etched on each tablet, although that's not explicitly stated in the biblical text. But for our purposes in this message, the way the commandments appeared on the tablets is unimportant. The important fact is that, is that each appeared on the tablets. So we will simply accept that five per tablet tradition without further discussion. The first four commandments clearly deal with man's relationship with God. We will see in this message how the fifth commandment fits with the God commandments. The remaining five commandments concern God's relationship with man, or I'm sorry, with man's re relationship with his fellow man. Of the 613 biblical commands, God selected these 10 for special attention. He directly communicated them to the Israelite nation and the mixed multitude gathered with them at Mount Sinai without using Moses as an intermediary. The Lord personally inscribed the commandments on the tablets, which were later placed in the Holy Ark. Over the course of this two-week series, we will look at each of the 10 commandments. The first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. What we would call the preamble to the first commandment is actually considered by most Jews to be the first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In Judaism, there are two schools of thought for this statement. First, the underlying commandment is to believe that God exists. By, by this implication, we are commanded to believe in God. That is, to believe that there is a supreme being who is the creator of everything. This resets our belief in the Lord, reminding us of the foundation of our belief as stated in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. God created everything in the heavens, the earth, and everything that is on the earth, including us. Psalm 19.1-4 reminds us, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They, have, they use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words, to the end of the world. Without a creator, there is no meaning or purpose to our lives. The second school of thought doesn't question whether or not there is a God, a creator of everything. Rather, it focuses on who is God. 
And the answer is, the Lord Hashem yod heh vav -Heh. The Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. If you don't believe in God, then you certainly won't believe in God who commands you to believe in him. God specifically identifies himself in the terms most relevant to the Israelite people at Sinai. The Israelites were far more likely to relate to the God who had just liberated them from slavery than to the God who created the universe. The creator of the universe would certainly be awesome and inspiring, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he cares about his creation. Many people today accept that there has to be some deity or creator be, being who created the universe because there are simply too many interdependent systems that challenge happenstance. Even the very root beginning of all things, science, rests upon an unexplained and unexplainable event without accepting a creator. That would be the Big Bang Theory. These people who accept a creator, while at the same time reject God, the God of the Bible, subscribe to a belief that was first put forward by Aristotle as the unmovable mover. This is a creator who does create and sets the natural systems in motion, but then abandons his creation to see what will happen. But this is not God. And this is not who is described here. God establishes immediately in the Ten Commandments that he cares about his creation and the act that he acts in history. The fact that God cares about us matters more to us than the fact that he created the world. Most Christians understand the understanding of the Ten Commandments is that verse 2 is the preamble to the Ten Commandments. So commandment 1 starts at verse 3. However, I think we should retain verse 2 as part of commandment 1 because this reminds us who God is and that he personally involves himself in the workings of this world that he created. When we first or when we think of the first commandment, you shall have no other gods uh, beside me. Most people think he's referring to the worship of gods like the ancient Greek, Roman, Egyptian pantheons, or perhaps worshiping the sun, the moon, or stars, or nature, or water. Most people also think this is an ancient tradition, largely given over to history. As a result, most people in modern times think of this commandment as essentially irrelevant. Who today would be considered normal for worshiping rain, wind, or thunder gods? The truth is, the first commandment is not only relevant today, it is and always has been the preeminent commandment. Indeed, Jesus identified this as the greatest commandment when he replied in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37, that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Yes, I know, Jesus was quoting the Shema, not the first commandment. But if you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, there is no room left for another God. The reason for this being the greatest commandment is that through identifying false gods, we eliminate one of the greatest barriers to a good world. There are at least as many false gods today as there were in ancient times. Many of these false gods are both dangerous and hidden in plain sight. One of the most consequential semi-hidden false gods is the worship of science. Not that science is intrinsically evil, it is not. It is the improper use of science, the total reliance upon science, and the worship of science that is wrong. Today, workers of evil use science as their back backdrop and reason for worming their way into our lives in order to control us. In the past, there were other methods more commonly used but those are for another lesson. For now, we will limit our dis discussion to those self-appointed or politically positioned 
priests and prophets of science that assure us they, they know what is best for us. They are the experts, so just listen to them and do what they tell us. Obey us, and though in the end you will have nothing, we assure that you that you will be happy. At least that is their mantra. If these priests and prophets have their way, we will have no money, no freedom, no choices, no possessions, no rights, and most importantly, no God. We have been told, especially and repeatedly in recent times, by these political and media and manufacturing elites just to follow the science. What they really mean is just do what we tell you, because often the science, when truly analyzed, provides a different conclusion. Let's skip the elephant in the room right now. You know, the COVID-19 elephant and the empirical evidence and the provable truths there. Instead, we will look at two other examples, babies and sex. The priesthood of science tells us that babies aren't babies until after they are born and wanted. So for this priesthood, a baby may be a baby if the mother wants it to be. So that if someone, either through accident or malice, causes harm to a baby and that baby is wanted, they can be charged with murder or manslaughter and be so convicted. But that same baby in some states, like New York, can even be delivered alive after full gestation, and that baby is not really a baby if the mother doesn't want it to be. And this, it's just a piece of parasitic flesh to be destroyed, to be used for other scientific experimentation. Yet science tells us from the point of conception onward, that baby, if properly cared for and nurtured, has everything it needs to develop into a fully functioning adult human being, which quite interestingly agrees with what God tells us about babies in the Bible. The second example is that the priesthood of science tells us that, sex, that the sex of an individual is indeterminate. An individual may decide whether they are male, female, a combination of the two, neither, or something entirely different like maybe a Martian or an octopus or a clam or something even more ridiculous than that. Yet both science and the Bible agree on this point. Human beings are, come in two forms, male and female. This determination cannot be made later on. It's made at conception. And this is agreed to by both science and the Bible. Yet, the priesthood of science have, priests of science have so worked their way into the political mainstream that should I say what I just said in Canada, I could be jailed. Yet it's an empirical truth. Human beings come in two forms, male and female, and that determination is made at conception. Yep, that little, uh, little gem is worthy of jail in Canada. But don't be feeling too safe because you live in America. Just a few years ago, that very similar legislation got passed into law in California. Fortunately, the California Supreme Court recognized the stupidity of it and struck it down. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to try again. Sadly, we have been silent about or perhaps ignorant of the, of the effectiveness of the priests of science. These people have been effective at removing God from the public schools, talking about God or the Bible with a student unless directly answering a student's question can get a public school teacher disciplined or fired. Yet teaching children about sexual perversion, mutilating one's body, and killing babies is considered by many public school districts as an essential part of primary school education. 
We are allowing our children to be taught to not just place another God before the Lord, but to replace him entirely with a, the false god of hedonism, also known as follow the science. Here's another question for you. What comes first in your life? God or your family? That's a tough one, isn't it? Here's Jesus saying something. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. That's tough. Now, we know Jesus isn't telling us that we need to hate our family in order to follow him. In fact, there are other commandments about properly caring for one's family. But because Hebrew and Aramaic lack a comparative verb phrase like more than or less than, this is how it's phrased. So it should be understood that we need to love Jesus and the Father more than we love our family. We don't need to hate them. In fact, we need to take care of them. How about work? Which comes first? Oh, here's a tough one. What about that OSU game that comes on at noon on Saturday? Or that Little League ball game? What about your time? Does God get first dibs on your time, or does he get, what it, get whatever is left over? Please understand, I'm not trying to accuse anyone here. Convict, yes. Accuse, not a chance. You see, I'm at least as guilty of misplaced priorities as anyone else listening to this message. Every one of us must share a special relationship with God and not allow any power, person, or activity to interfere with or disturb our relationship with God. Second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You, can't, you shall, shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. This commandment has two primary purposes. The first one is pretty easy. Don't make images intended to re be representation of little g gods. I think that most Christians and Jews get this. Having an image of something designed to represent a god hanging about the house or in the yard is a bad thing. So I don't think that we have to spend any time exploring this. The second purpose, that takes some thinking about and some careful soul searching. This commandment also seems to command us to not create an image of something intended to represent the Lord our God. Deuteronomy 4, 15 and 16 says this, you saw no form of any kind the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape. Because people tend to gravitate to things that are tangible more so than things that are ethereal, there is a tendency to confuse image with essence. There is, therefore, a danger that if the Lord is depicted visually, whether in sculpture or in picture, people will confuse the depiction with God. This phenomenon can easily be demonstrated with the bronze serpent commanded by God in Numbers 21, 6 through 9, kindly introduced by Dr. Steve during Bible study. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes, or will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. 
So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. For 700 odd years, this bronze snake was held by the Israelite people, first in the camp in the wilderness, and later when it was erected in the high places in Israel. However, King Hezekiah found it necessary to destroy the bronze serpent because it had become itself an object of worship. This happened despite the snake sculpture being commissioned by God and created by Moses. If something commissioned by God can be later misused, how easily can something created by man even if for religious purposes be corrupted. I will admit that this is a very touchy and perhaps dangerous subject to look at. It is very close to the heart of many people, including many that I dearly love. Please don't take this as a swipe against anyone or any particular object. This is about activity, misplaced affection. Loving an object which is at least in part standing in the place of our Lord. It is not about doing away with a particular item or physical representation. It is about what we venerate in our life. This is a hard question. So let's start with this, these. Is there anything in your life other than the Lord through Jesus Christ that you pray to? Is there any physical items, or are there any physical items, that you or others that you know bow down to, worship, sing songs about, even at times kiss in religious reverence? Are there locations, buildings, or structures that are venerated to the point of being worshipped? I think that after some close close personal examination, every one of us can identify some level of guilt here. Rather than spend time talking about any of these specific religious objects standing in the place of a God, I think we'll move for a change of venue. Let's move this to table talk during our meal. It could get quite interesting. I look forward to it. The third commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. If you have the type of upbringing, anything like mine, this commandment was the one held over your head to keep you from using, well, flowery language. You know that all those expletives let loose by your uncles when they are working on a project and they swing that hammer and it comes down and wham on the wrong nail. Yeah, those expletives. Well, I admit that this language restricting meaning may well be within this commandment. There are some other aspects that need to be looked at. We have a relationship to the Lord through the Messiah that is indeed both intimate and personal. But you must never lose perspective. He is our creator, not our buddy. Coming before the Lord in a flippant or irreverent fashion is foolish, disrespectful, and dangerous. Too many people today think think of God and Jesus as their go to the movies, watch the football game together, hang out with buddy. That's not God. That's not respecting him. That's not loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, and with all your soul. There's a few references that say that. If you love and respect the Lord, you will obey him. Deuteronomy 11.20 says, Be careful to obey all these commandments I am giving you. Show love to the Lord your God by walking in his ways and holding tightly to him. Kind of Old Testament, right? But in John 14, 15, and 21, if you love me, you will keep my commands, commandments. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him 
and reveal myself to him. So rather than treat the Lord and Jesus as a buddy and thereby think that we are somehow loving him, the Lord told us that we demonstrate our love through, uh, for him through our obedience. But aren't there those self-acclaimed scholars who say that this is Torah? This is law? It's being legalistic? And all such things were hung on the cross. But why then did Jesus reiterate obedience? And he re reiterated this obedience to the commandments as a means of demonstrating our love for the Father. Here's another point. Dennis Prager, and those of you who don't know who he is, I suggest you look him up. He's a, he's a good man to look at. Dennis Prager had a very interesting take on, the, on this commandment in the Rational Bible uh, Exodus section. First, he points out that there is a, various ser various, uh, ah, a very serious, that's two words, not one, <laughs> a very serious statement concerning violating this commandment that does not exist in any of the other nine commandments. The Lord will not hold him guiltless. Literally, the Lord will not cleanse the one who violates this commandment. Why would the Lord consider using his name in vain to be one that, that he will not cleanse a person from when he is prepared for, to forgive what we would consider to be a much more consequential sin like stealing, lying, or perhaps even murder? Quoting Mr. Prager. Oh, I thought I put it in there. The ultimate and far more important reason for the, uh, this sin is unforgivable is due to something else, which can only be understood if we translate the verb of this commandment literally. Do not take is not what the commandment actually says. The Hebrew verb in the commandment, tisah, means carry. The commandment therefore reads, do not carry God's name in vain. So what does it mean to carry God's name in vain? When one is claiming to be acting in God's name, yet is doing the opposite, acting with evil intent, that person would be carrying the Lord's name in vain. Normally, when someone acts improperly, their improper behavior reflects poorly on them. However, when someone is representing the Lord and, act, and acts improperly, they sully the Lord's reputation. This discredits God and dramatically reduces the opportunity to bring others to faith. No atheist is nearly as effective at alienating people from God than an evil acting self-acclaimed religious person. The fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall, do, you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For six days the Lord made, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Remember the Sabbath day also means to sanctify it, setting it apart to the Lord. Maintaining this relationship with God requires effort on our part. All too often we are so immersed in our daily routine that we forget that, is our, that it is our connection with God which matters most. Therefore God commanded us to allocate one day every week for relationship maintenance. This day is the Sabbath day. From the beginning of time, this day has been and remains the seventh day. This, it is a day to focus on the real priorities in life, to draw inspiration for the following week, and to rest from our work. Some, through misguided tradition or wrong teaching, have eliminated the Sabbath day remembrance in their lives, or attempted to assign it to another day. 
But even Sabbath keepers may need to reassess their standing with the Sabbath. It does not say to remember the Sabbath day and rest. Rather, it says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Certainly, regular work is prohibited. Whoops, sorry. Too far. Uh, certainly, regular work is prohibited on Sabbath. But our primary focus of Sabbath should be to not to rest. It should be to make Sabbath holy. Kadosh, uh, the whole Hebrew word normally translated as holy, also means separate or distinct. In this case, it is to keep Sabbath separate and distinct from the other six days of the week. The first six days of the week are regular, common days of the week, days for earning an income, cleaning, gardening, traveling, cooking. In short, all the regular things of life. Whereas Sabbath is the holy day, it is a day elevated above the other days, a day elevated to God. Because the Sabbath is elevated to God, we can't just rest, stay in bed, or be a couch potato from sunset Friday through sunset Saturday. Although if we did just lay about all day on Sabbath, we would certainly be rested. We would not have made it holy. Regular work on Sabbath is not permitted, but holy work is not only permitted, it is essential if one is to properly observe the Sabbath and if one is to walk correctly before the Lord. In the days of the tabernacle and later when the temple stood, priests and Levites were notably busier on Sabbath. The regular daily burnt offerings was two lambs, one in the morning and one in the evening. On Sabbath, the number of lambs sacrificed was doubled to four. On the Sabbath day, present two, two unblemished year-old male lambs accompanied by a grain offering of two tenths of an ephah, fine flour mixed with oil, as well as a drink offering. This is, the burn, this is the burn offering for every Sabbath, in addition to the regular burn offering and its drink offering. So not only does this tell us that the priests were working on Sabbath, they were working harder than on a normal day at least where sacrifices were concerned. And also remember they would have had to be tending the fires, uh, carrying wood, and placing it upon the altar. And like modern day preachers, I suspect that their teaching and preaching requirements had a significant uptick on Sabbath. We also get the idea that certain work outside the temple confines was considered acceptable. And I would argue God inspired or at least covered by positive commandments, overruling the don't work commandment. When we, we find good evidence for this in Jesus' healing on the Sabbath, and hints of broader allowances. I will use Luke 14, 1 through 6, and Matthew 12, 9 through 12 as the proof text for this. And there are others, but these are quite clear. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And he said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Not doing regular work is what is commanded. Work that can and should be done on the other six days should not be done on Sabbath. However, there are times or situations where doing what appears to be regular work may be and should be done on Sabbath. Changing tires, for example. Replacing a worn out tire or rotating your car's tires on, should not be done on Sabbath. However, if you see someone on the side of the road with a flat tire, lending a hand to that person by changing their tire would not be a problem. 
as Jesus said, stated, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. There's one more thing that needs to be considered in this commandment to remember the Sabbath. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Some sages teach that it is an obligation to work six days a week. Others teach that one should do all one's work in the six days of the week so as to be able to stop working on Sabbath. Whichever interpretation uh, one subscribes to is less important than the implication that Torah values labor. In Torah, there are no negative associations with labor or earning an income. In fact, Paul has this to say in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 10. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from any brother who leads an undisciplined life that is not in keeping with the tradition you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not undisciplined among you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. Instead, in labor and toil, we worked night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Not that we lacked this right, but we wanted to offer ourselves as an example for you to imitate. For even while we were with you, we gave you this command. If anyone is unwilling to work, he shall not eat. Could you imagine applying that across the United States? Note the unwilling, not unable. There's a difference there. Unwilling, unable. Unable, we have an obligation to care for. If you want to learn more about why we keep Sabbath, go on the Marian Bible website and search for Richard Bigford, Bigford's, uh, Bigford's uh, Sabbath day and Wednesday night Bible study lessons. He gave uh, in early March of this year. His study is easy to follow and to the point. The fifth commandment. This is one we talked about with the kids. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, if the tablets had the commandments evenly distributed with five commandments on each tablet, why is the fifth commandment included on the how to treat God tablet? Doesn't this commandment belong on the second tablet? After all, it is the first of the Ten Commandments addressing interhuman relations. All the other commandments dealing with interhuman relations are located on the second tablet. Yet, it is listed among the first five commandments, right after the commandment to observe Sabbath. Commandment four and five serve as bridges between commandments relating to God and commandments relating to people. The commandment to remember Sabbath starts with acknowledging God, but then the greater portion of the commandment deals with the proper treatment of family members, servants, animals, and even strangers. As for our parents, they, along with the Lord, are our co-creators. Parents are biological creators, and the Lord, our spiritual creator. Honoring parents is one of the principal building blocks to a successful civilization. Societies in which parents are honored tend to survive a very long time, which is uh, included in the commandment, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. The bridge between God and people is equally apparent when you consider that a person who does not honor his or her parents is very unlikely to honor divine authority. Moral order is dependent upon a hierarchy where child submits to parental authority and parents submit to divine authority. It is also interesting in the fifth commandment that along with the fourth commandment, these are the only commandments that are stated in a, as positive commandments. The one saying, do this, instead of 
don't do this. This should tell you how important these two commandments are. They are the two that are telling you to do something as opposed to telling you to not do something. The fourth and fifth commandments require activity, action, and involvement. The rest of the uh, commandments require inactivity, inaction, or restraint. The importance of the fifth commandment is further underscored when one considers that this is the only commandment of the whole Torah requiring us to honor someone or something. Some may try to say that this is just some uh, old co covenant tradition, but not really relevant to us today. But in Mark 7, 8, through 13, Jesus is reminding us of both the importance of honoring one's parents and of not setting aside any of the Lord's commandments for the sake of any human tradition or custom. You have disregarded the commandment of God to keep the tradition of men. He went on to say, you neatly set aside the command of God to maintain your own tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say it, if, that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever you would have received from me is Corban, that is a gift devoted to God, he is no longer permitted to do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by, th by the tradition you have handed down. And you do so in many such matters. A great threat to honoring parents is coming in two formerly trusted institutions. A very recently re released movie from a particular entertainment corporation, well known for its family and children's television programs and movies, and even more, encourages children to resist their parents. It pushes the theme, my body, my choice or whatever pleases me is what I want to do. Ignoring parental guidance is pushed completely aside as unnecessary and intrusive. Children are getting the same message for, messages from schools and teachers. Laws have been passed in some states allowing schools to deliver girls to clinics for birth control, even abortions, without notifying parents. In Washington state, children can be taken away from parents who decline to provide so-called gender-affirming therapies, which are the exact opposite of affirming the child's gender. Rather, these therapies deny the God, child's God-given, science-confirmed gender. In Washington state, the schools are often the primary conduit for such treatments, sometimes resorting to threatening parents with legal action should the parents not agree to mutilate their children. We are going to end today and pick up with the remaining five commandments next week. In closing, here are a couple of reminders to consider this week. In the original Hebrew, the Ten Commandments are all addressed in the singular. On the one hand, the Ten Commandments had to be addressed to the Israelites as a relative, as, as a collective whole. For if even one person was missing, the Torah could not have been given. On the other hand, however, they were addressed to every person as an individual, independent of everyone else. Each individual received the Torah in a unique, personal way, tailored to his or her internal, spiritual, and psychological needs. For any who might think that the Lord's commandments are somehow hung on a cross or otherwise obsolete, here are a couple apostolic verses to pray through this week. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden light.
Let's pray. Father, as we go about this week, may we each think about your commandments, and especially the Ten Commandments. And Father, where we are falling short, guide us, direct us back to how you would have us walk out your commandments. And Father, we know that we are not perfect and we will fail. For that, we bless you for sending your Son, Jesus the Christ, to be our Redeemer and our salvation. We do bless you for, for the Him and for this day and for this time spent with you. Amen. Our benediction. Let your heart, therefore, be wholly devoted to the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. To do this, you will need to rejoice in all things, preserving in tradition and remain devoted to prayer. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. All right, we'll step over here and we will set up.